Good morning, church. Thank you, Brother Charles, for that prayer. Much needed. Before I get started, I have a couple of tangents to go on. And the first is I'll give you the same disclaimer that I gave Monterey Church uh, last week. And that is that I've got like major allergies this season. And so if you see my eyes watering, I'm not crying over my own sermon. Um, it's the allergies. I took a Claritin and it seems to be working in waves at one moment. I'll be sneezing an itchy throat. And then next it's totally clear and fine. For some reason, I feel like these two bushels of flowers right here don't have too much pollen in them. So it'll be all right. But we'll see what happens in the next wave that's coming here. The second tangent is that song, um, Count Your Blessings. And, and y'all know that music, God just really does something with music and songs for us. And it reminded me of this story. And that is that I have this older cousin. I always called him Uncle Jack, even though he's not my uncle. He's my cousin. Well, Cousin Jack is an educator and we, we all grew up in, in New Mexico, and, and Jack was a principal at a school and became a superintendent and started disagreeing with some of the things and the policies and the actions that they started to want to take. And so we started looking around the nation for other places to teach and be a principal at. And he was, um, he was really convicted inside because he's like, I have to uproot my family to make this move, and where am I going to go? And he was coming back from an interview and he was sitting on the plane and it felt like just the weight of all of his responsibility was coming down on his shoulder as he was flying back home. And that song just kind of popped into his head, count your blessings, name them one by one. And so he's sitting in that airplane and he's like, you know what? I do have a lot of blessings. My family's been loyal. I have a great family. I've never had to skip a meal. I've got plenty of cars. I've got opportunities for teaching. He started counting all of his blessings and he's like, I actually have more to be thankful for than I have concern to be. And it was because of that song. So that's that second, that second tangent there. Open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter one. We're gonna camp in this section right here for mostly the whole sermon. And the title of the sermon is Fear and Love. And we're going to look at how when you capitalize on love, you kind of forget the fear that's all involved. And that little fear may be there still, but when you focus on love, you can realize how much you can do, and especially how much you can do for God's kingdom and in the name of Jesus. And Timothy, as you know, was an understudy of Paul. Paul kind of took him from his home and educated him and mentored him as he went off into the ministry by himself. And you'll notice in a lot of the, the letters from Paul that he sends out, in regards to Timothy, he says things like, accept Timothy, like, be ready to receive Timothy, receive Timothy. And that's probably because Timothy had, as his name sort of implies, a very timid spirit about him, very active in his ministry, but it's, we speculate that Timothy was maybe a little bit shy and his work and going to all these new places. I mean, that's kind of relatable. You go to places you don't know and you might be a little bit shy. And so Paul's been writing these letters and when he sends them and they involve Timothy, receive Timothy, some encouragement for Timothy. And then we come up to the second letter for Timothy from Paul that gives him a very similar sort of encouragement, but it's very direct to Timothy. So if we look here in 2 Timothy chapter one, this is how Paul writes to Timothy in verse, um, uh, let me back up to verse five, Second Timothy chapter one, verse five. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I'm reminding you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. There's an interesting concept in there, laying on of hands. And that's kind of like a, that's a, that's a phrase that rings the bell, right? When you think of laying on of hands, you think of all the other times that it's happened and what's happened with those. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples here. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter six, we have a similar situation 
when there's a few that are selected to serve. In Acts chapter 6, some men are called to serve and take care of the things we, we might call it to, to wait on tables while the apostles continue to preach and teach. So in Acts chapter 5, excuse me, Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, and what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurius, and Nacor, and Timon, and Parnius, and Nicholas, and, and uh, a proselyte of Antioch. They set them before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So there it is again. The apostles laid their hands on these selected few. Just as Timothy had the apostle lay his hands on him. And what's the result of when it happens here in Acts chapter 6? Stephen, the one that had his, he was full of the Holy Spirit, had the apostles lay his hands on him, and they prayed. And look here in verse 8 of Acts chapter 6. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And then if you skip down to verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. This man, Stephen, the apostles lay his hands on him. He's already full of the Holy Spirit. Look what he can do. Look what's being worked through him. How about that other guy up there, Philip? A very similar situation over in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, and um, let's see here. Acts chapter 8 and verse, um, let's do verse 12. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Philip has gone out to preach, and he's made a lot of conversions. He's one of these that also the apostles laid his hands on him. But if you look over just on the other side of the column, and we change over to verse 14, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that, um, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. Now two apostles are going, who come down and pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You see, it's a very special thing for an apostle to lay his hands on you. Look what happened to Stephen. Look what happens to Philip when it comes out of that. God is working through his apostles when he lays his hands on somebody. The idea of laying hands also goes back all the way to the Old Testament here. If we look at uh, uh, Numbers 27 and 18, Moses is about to give leadership over to Joshua, right? And so Moses lays his hand on Joshua. And then if you also look over in Deuteronomy 34, 9, it says Joshua, a very similar thing to what we read right here. Joshua full of spirit and wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So here you go, Timothy. You're a little bit scared. You're a little bit timid about the work that's being put before you. Look at this. An apostle has laid his hands on you. You're equipped for this, Timothy. God has done something where he's worked through the apostle when they laid their hands on you. So let's read this here again, 2 Timothy chapter 1. For this reason, I'm reminded to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. God's working through you, Timothy. Not only this, but if we, if we put it side by side between mom and grandma and Paul and, and God the Father, this is what you wind up with. The faith, your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice. Your faith came through your mothers and to you, Timothy. Power, it came from God, your father, and Paul, your spiritual father, and to you, Timothy. You've got both sets here that are working. In. You've got a lot that's in you, Timothy, for you to start working. 
It's all coming down to you. You might be a little bit timid, but you're fully equipped. You're ready to go. And then he moves on to what's in the spirit. Fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Verse 7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Love, that right there. The greatest quality of a Christian. That's one of the greatest gifts. That's one of the greatest things that you can display. You remember in 1 Corinthians, when Paul is saying, not everybody is an apostle. Not everybody prophesies. Not everybody speaks in tongues. And then you move into 1 Corinthians 13. He's like, even if you could speak in tongues, but you don't love, it's just a bunch of symbols. You can do the greatest things that seem like the greatest things, but without love, it means nothing. You know what the greatest power is? That's love. You know what's included in this spirit, in this Holy Spirit that's inside you? Love. The greatest thing. The trademark of the Christian. You know how Jesus puts it to his disciples? They'll know that you belong to me by your love for each other. How has love been shown to you, Timothy? Well, definitely by your mom and your grandma. They loved you so much that they took this knowledge of faith and it was so important for them to teach it to you. You've seen the same thing come through Paul. I love you so much that I'm gonna, I'm gonna educate you and I'm gonna build you up into a leader. You can also look at this in 1 John chapter four, 1 John chapter four, the chapter of love and verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son and through him, excuse me, his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Skip the line there. You have, what is love? It's right here. God is love and that's what's in you. How did God show his love? He sent his only son into the world. In verse 10, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. How do you observe love? It looks like this. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to to love one another. There you go, Timothy. God is love and he is in you. You've got the greatest thing in you for you to do the work. We can observe love from our standpoint. And, and when we notice love, we know exactly what it is. Think about like, like uh, uh, a house is on fire. The baby's still inside. Do you think the parents are going to stand outside? No, mom and dad's going to run inside and go get the baby not because they're qualified firefighters, but because they love their child, they're going to do something miraculous like that to show what their love is, to show and not even because they think and they reason, I better love my kid by saving them. It's the natural instinct. It's like a pin rolling off the table and you pick it up off the ground because that's what you do when a pin rolls off the table. This spirit of love that's inside you, Timothy, it should be natural. And it's natural along with self-control and the power of the Holy Spirit, because God placed it within you. And if we look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8 and 9, God is love, and he abides in you, and you abide in him. So that adds to it, Timothy, not only has God equipped you in the laying on of my hands, the love that's within you, you're equipped with that also. You focus on the love and you're going to be doing exactly what you need to do, especially for all these other places that you're going to go out and have to preach and teach and establish elders at. The work will be there. You go. You're ready to go. Because that part about fear, back in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God gave us a spirit not of fear. That's not something God put in you. That sounds more like a personal 
obstacle that you're going to have to overcome. And you've already got the answers to overcome that personal fear that you have. God's already equipped you for the work that you need to do. God's already given you his spirit. You focus on the spirit and love, and that flame of fear is going to go down to a little pilot light because you're going to fan the flame of the spirit. Wherever you need to go, you don't need to worry about what people are going to say about you, what people are going to think about you, what people are going to judge about you. You need to be worried about how God sees you, how God perceives you. What is God going to say about you? What is God going to observe you doing, knowing that he put a gift inside of you, Timothy? You might have a gift in you, but you also need that faith to use that gift. You need to put it to work and to get to work. So here's an encouragement for Timothy that Paul writes out. And then if you look just past that, it's a little bit, it's almost a little bit funny because here's Paul in verse eight and nine, and he's saying, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God. Paul is writing this with chains on. He's in prison. And he's like, don't be afraid. It's okay. You're equipped. Well, Paul was equipped. Look what happened to him. <laughs> he's in jail. And still he's like, there's no reason to be afraid. You have God on your side. You have God to answer to. And God is sending you forth. Almost in other words, Timothy, it might be a little bit hard, but you're going to have to suck it up and do some work, the work that God has equipped you to do, the responsibility that you have. As a little footnote to all of that, over in Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 13, There's a, there's a debate over the book of Hebrews authorship, and uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe that it's probably Apollos that wrote Hebrews and sent it out. And both Timothy and Hebrews were written a little bit later. Um, I'm also inclined to think that First and Second Timothy are probably written uh, uh, after Paul was released from prison the first time, and now he's back. And there's evidence for that. And that's important to this little piece here in Hebrews, because of all the times that Paul is saying, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed of my chains, get to work, do what God has called you to do. If you look over here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 23, this is what it then says about Timothy much later on. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. All that to wrap up to say, Timothy took the encouragement and used his gift and worked and honored what had been given to him from God and his mothers and loved the churches because he worked so hard that he got into the same situation that Paul did. Arrested and in chains and he was happy to suffer. But later on was released. It seems like Paul encouraged Timothy enough to say, you're fully equipped and ready for the work. There's no reason to be afraid when you're full of love and power and wisdom and self-control. Church, we are full of the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized into Jesus. You are full of the Holy Spirit. And you know those gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, faith. That's in you too. Suffering, as we know, might be and is probably guaranteed, if we believe the Bible, a part of being a Christian. But God has equipped you fully to suffer. 
God has equipped you fully to spread his word. God has equipped you fully to be faithful to him, even to the very end. And God has equipped you to love most of all. And you'll see the results of that. And God has also equipped you for defense, as we observe from Ephesians 6, 13 to 20. You put on the whole armor of God. You're equipped. You're ready to go. And you're ready to take up the mission. So he's foothills, We're kind of in a weird time where things keep changing every day and whatnot. Whatever happens, God has equipped you for the work of his kingdom. God has equipped you to show love to each other and to the outside world, one that really, really needs him. It might be a little bit scary. But Paul shows us, you focus on God and the love and the spirit that he's placed inside you. And everything's going to be all right. Because you're on his side and everything has come through him. If you need to be baptized, the water's ready. Come and be on the winning side, the equipped side. If you're in hard times, well, we can count your blessings together and we can pray for you. Won't you let your need be known as we sing this song?